Go with me if you read Esther chapter 4. I know that we're moving slowly through this book, but this is my favorite way to study scripture. Verse by verse, seeing it, how it plays out, seeing all the different themes that come to the surface. And so uh, I had somebody ask when we're going to be finished. Let's just say this, we're in chapter 4, and there are 11 chapters. So you can, you can do your own math. No, we'll be finished by the end of the year. We'll, we'll finish Esther this year, and we'll start something new as we go into next year. But my goal as we study through this book is not just to open up the story of Esther. And I, ho I hope you see that, because all the scripture is connected. But my goal isn't just to teach you a story that you may not have studied otherwise. My goal is not to just get you interested in the Old Testament. Although you definitely should be interested in the Old Testament as more than just a collection of fun Sunday school stories, okay? My goal is not even just to teach you interesting things about the ancient Near East and the historical details, okay? My goal in this series is to teach you something really important about who God is. And so the word I want to talk about tonight, and this is going to be a, a topic that divides the church. Now, hopefully not our church, but divides churches, and that's the issue of God's sovereignty. So we throw this word around a lot. What do you think sovereignty means? What does it mean for God to be sovereign? He has the right to rule. Yeah, the right to rule. That's good. What else? I don't know. We say these words. And, and, it's, and it's fair because in church I think we use a lot of language that nobody understands what it means. And people are on the outside. I remember the first time we had one of the youth uh, visit in one of our churches. And we sang songs that morning in church about Jesus' blood. Okay? Now, to us, that's something that I see and I realize that without his, his shed blood for me, I have no forgiveness of my sins. That his blood is what it, it took to, to offer that sacrifice to pay the penalty for my sins. But this girl came to our youth and then left that day grossed out. She's like, I don't like, why is everything about blood? And we sang a song that literally says, there's a fountain filled with blood. Right? And it's a beautiful song, but... We take things sometimes and we use this language without really interpreting it or saying what it means. So, God's sovereignty. Now, I'm going to tell you about two different extremes in terms of God's sovereignty. There's a group of people who believe that God's sovereignty means that he's deterministic. That everything that happens, every event that happens, is because he decreed it to happen. I'm talking about dust falling to the floor it means that God decreed that to happen. The, the cosmic violence of a, a star going supernova, God decreed that to happen, that everything happens because God said that it would happen. Okay, so that's, that's one very extreme view. And listen, this is what that means if you take it all the way to the extreme. That means that God makes people sin. Right? That's, that's, that's the very extreme of this idea that if you sin, it's because God decreed for you to sin. Okay? Now, I think, I think that's biblically inconsistent. All right? That's just my opinion. And, and if you disagree with any of this, I, I, I invite a conversation later on. This is fun stuff. But I, 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 I just can't see in Scripture that God would judge somebody for a sin that he forced them to commit. And so that's, that's one extreme. The only problem is, is on the other end of the spectrum, people say that... that I'm, I'm talking very opposite end, that God has no control and that he reacts to things at the same rate that we react to things. So like, read if I just came up to you, I'm just like, you did not react at all. Man, that was, that was an intense focus in that moment. So if somebody does that to you and you react, that's because you didn't know it was going to happen. So there is a branch of Christianity that believes that God doesn't know what is going to happen and so he reacts to things. That is completely unbiblical. And so what I want to do is find a way in the middle between these two, two extremes. I want to find a way in the middle. This is what I believe. I believe that God, in his sovereignty, he knows all things. He is omniscient. He knows the future from the past. He knows all things. And so he works his will into this world. What he wills, he will accomplish. And he works and coordinates his will with our free choices and with the effects of sin and evil in this world. Now, to me, in, in, in this worldview, when I look at this theology, I think only a God who is sovereign could coordinate what he ultimately desires and wants with people's free choices. 
Right? And so I look at this, he's weaving a tapestry together. Like Romans chapter 8 says that all things work together for the good of those who love God. That he takes even the evil things in this world and works it into his will so that his will is accomplished. And I know that this is, that this is stuff that we can argue about all day long, and that's fine. I'm just giving you what, what I believe and how we're going to work this into, into the story of Esther. A.W. Tozer was a famous uh, preacher and writer, and this is what he said about this. I really like this. He said, God's sovereignty is like an ocean liner, departing New York City, bound for Liverpool, England. The people on board the ship are free to do as they please, but they aren't free to change the course of the ship. So I, I think that gives us a good indication that the people on board the ship, we make free choices. Now, uh, we obviously are, are lost in sin and shame outside of our relationship with Jesus Christ, but we are not able to change the course of history. He moves his will into the fabric of all things. And so you look at this in terms of the story of Esther. Okay, Now the story of Esther, if I read this as a non-believer, this is a book of an incredible amount of big coincidences. Right? When you look at this, that, that Ahasuerus, this wicked king, he had a problem with his wife and, and, and kind of booted her out, ex exiled her away from the palace, and then he got lonely, and in that moment, who did God raise up? Esther, who was the one person who was able to accomplish God's will in this moment. That's, to me, way bigger than a coincidence. Things happen in your life. Uh, I'll tell you this. Um, about 10 years before Mindy and I met, I talked to her on the phone. All right? And we were on separate continents, so it wasn't like we lived in the same town. Her pastor in Waco was taking a missions trip to Bolivia, and so he wanted to talk to my dad who was coordinating it. And so Mindy was there in the office that day. And it, was, it, it took a long time in those days. Like, in those days, phone calls were really long. And, and, it, and they were very expensive. Like, you guys, you just don't know. It's, it's, it's so crazy. You know, I had to pay for individual text messages. Isn't that, isn't that wild? Like, one day, one time I got a $300 cell phone bill because I had sent Mindy and I were dating and we texted all night. Okay, so. But we talked on the phone 10 years before we even met. We didn't know who each other were, and it was just this, this coincidence, right? And, and so I remember her voice 10 years later. I was like, I remember your voice, and I fell in love with you. No, I didn't really. I didn't know who she was. But, but we look at this, and, it, it, and so God, it, it's, this is not a series of coincidences. This is obviously God in the background doing the things that his will requires. Over and over and over, he was the one who, who put these people in place. We've been talking about it like this as a series of dominoes. You know how you set up dominoes and you tip them over? That, that, was a, that was a fun thing when I was a kid. The older I get, the worse it is to me. Because it seems like there's a lot of like prep work, and then you get like 10 seconds of dominoes. You're like, I, I took four hours to set this up, and then it was just gone in, in 10 seconds. I don't understand but when you look at this, this is, this is God in his sovereignty working his will into this situation. Now, did he force a hazardous to get drunk, to get prideful, to fall into a fit of rage and to kick uh, his wife Vashti out of, out of her position? Yeah. No, we can disagree. It's okay. It's all right. If you're saying, like, yeah, I do believe he did. Okay, that's, that's fine. I do not believe that he forced him to do this. I believe that was Ahasuerus' own sinful choice, and God used that choice to work his will into this situation. So we're going to see this over and over, but chapter 4 in Esther is the key chapter to seeing a sovereign God working behind the scenes. So let's look at this uh, in, in Esther chapter 4, and we're going to read the whole chapter. 17 verses, it's not really long. This chapter is really unique, and we'll, we'll talk about why. Probably the most famous verse in the book of Esther is, is going to be here in chapter 4, but um, if you've got that, why don't you stand and give honor to God's word with me. Esther chapter 4. And I'll say this as we continue. I'll make my position clear. I, I don't believe that God reacts to anything. I, I don't believe that he has ever looked and said, well, now that Mark's done that, now I've got to do this. He, he knows the end from the beginning. In fact, we see this in Isaiah chapter 46. I declare the end from the beginning long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. So God is sovereign in our lives. What will happen in this world ultimately happens because God desires it to happen. But I do believe that he co 
coordinates with, with our free choices. So I don't make that clear. So let's read this in chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had occurred, okay, what had occurred? Let's just get some background here. What had occurred in chapter 3? Guys remember? The decree. The decree, the command to do what? Kill all the Jews, okay? This is a problem for Mordecai because he is a Jew. So when Mordecai learned that all this had occurred, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went to the middle of the city and cried loudly and bitterly. He went only as far as the king's gate, since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. That's really, really interesting. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. There was great mourning among the Jewish people in every province where the king's command and edict came. They fasted, wept, and lamented, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to her, and the queen was overcome with fear. She sent clothes for Mordecai to wear so that he would take off his sackcloth, but he did not accept them. Esther summoned Hathach. He's got a really cool name. Um, it's really fun to say. In, in Hebrew, it's got two ch in it. So you really got to get the loop you going for. Um, one of her, one of the king's eunuchs, so she summoned him, and he attended her. And, and he, she dispatched him to Mordecai to learn what he was doing and why. So she, at this point, had not heard the news that all the Jews were going to be destroyed. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened as well as the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the slaughter of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa, or, or ordering their destruction, so that Hathak might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and command her to approach the king, implore his favor, and plead with him personally for her people. Again, an important little word hidden in here. Hathak came and repeated Mordecai's response to Esther, Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to tell Mordecai, all the royal officials and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courtyard who has not been summoned. What does the law say? The death penalty. Unless the king extends his gold scepter, allowing the person to live. I, I always view this as, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, when, when Commodus put his hand out, either give a thumbs up or thumbs down. That's what I'm thinking. There. I have not been summoned to appear before the king for the last 30 days. So Esther's response was reported to Mordecai. Mordecai told the messenger his reply to Esther, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you're in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. That is Mordecai's firm belief in God's sovereignty. So he's saying, if you are silent, it's, deliverance is going to come from somewhere else. But you and your fam father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? And here is the key verse in this chapter. Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa, that's the city they live in, and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night, days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. And after that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded. Okay. I know that's a lot to read and we'll unpack it here, but let's pray. Father God, I, I know that there is a great mystery in, in the issue of your sovereignty. There is a, a great divide in the church about what it means and, and, and how we can explore this. But Lord, I don't, I don't know all the answers, but what I, what I do is I, I trust you, Lord, that you are good, that you are omniscient and omnipotent, that nothing has happened in this world that wasn't outside of your perfect will, that, that, that this, the things that happen in our lives happen for a reason so that you can draw us toward the heart of Jesus Christ and draw us to our knees to give you glory. I pray that as we study through the book of Esther, we would not miss the fact that you are the main character. That it's not Esther, it's not Mordecai, it's not Haman, it's not the king, it's you. You stand tall over this, this book, casting your shadow of sovereignty through it. And I pray that we would see that and see the gospel present in these words. I thank you for Esther. Lord, I thank you for her story and how it impacts my heart and looking at my circumstances and how I can trust in you even in the very worst times. 
We love you, Lord. We thank you. We give you this time. And we dedicate it to you in your name. Amen. Okay. So I want to look at, I want to look at this in, in Esther chapter 4. I know we read the whole thing, but we're going to go piece by piece through it. So what I want to look at is three defining characteristics of God's people. So like when we look at this chapter, these are three things that define the people of God here in this chapter and should define us as believers today. So this should look like this. Number one is this. God's people are separate. God's people are separate. So when you look at this on the surface, what happened? What, what does Mordecai do? What do the Jewish people do when they hear the news? They put on sackcloth. What does that mean? You guys know, have you ever studied that? What does that mean? Put on sackcloth. What is, a, what is sackcloth? That's a good way to start. It's, it, so have you ever seen like the, the way that they used to put potatoes in, in a bag that's made out of burlap? It's like this rough material. Do I, yes. Okay. So think of that, but wearing it on your body. Itchy, uncomfortable. Uh, just, just, so that's what it was meant to be. So you would tear your clothes as a sign of grief and as a sign of sorrow, and you would put on the most uncomfortable clothing to show that you're going through something. That this was a ceremonial thing. It wasn't just like the first guy said, you know what? I've got a, a burlap sack in my, in my dresser, and I'm gonna just put it on and, and do this. No, this is something ceremonial. They would sit and, and they would wear this uncomfortable clothing to mark themselves as that something was happening. They would pour ashes on their heads to show that, that my life is, is going through a period of burning, of hurting, of, of pain and sorrow. So when you look at this story from the outside, this looks pretty desperate, doesn't it? Like these, this decree comes and then all of a sudden everybody is just, just going nuts. They're, they're crying out in the streets. They're, they're just, they're, it's, it's this moment of just hopeless desperation. That's how I've always read it, but I want you to see something really important here. If you, if there was a decree that said a certain ethnicity of people were going to be destroyed, and then all of a sudden something came to the middle of the land and started screaming at the top of their lungs and, and sitting down, and making a big spectacle, what would that do to the people around? I think they were weird. It'd be really strange. It would be more common back then, I think today, we'd probably call the police and see this. But here's what's happening, okay? Imagine if you were a Jew during the days of uh, pre-World War II, when, when they came through and swept the Jews out, put them into the ghettos, and took them to the concentration camps. What did they force them to wear? Anybody remember? Students in Stars. Yes, the, yeah, the, the, the gold star they were put on. And what did that do? It marked them as Jews. So what Mordecai and the people are doing is they're outing themselves. If the Jews are supposed to be destroyed and all of a sudden these people are causing a scene, when you look, what do you know about Mordecai? He's a Jew. He's a Jew. Okay? In this time, I don't know about you, but if I was a Jewish person and it was ordered that I was going to be destroyed, yeah, I would do everything I could to make myself less conspicuous. Right? I'd be like, oh, my God. Persian, man. I, I, I've been a Persian my whole life. My name is Fafah, right? I, I wouldn't draw attention to myself. So what Mordecai is doing, it's not out of a moment of where he loses his mind and grief. I believe this is calculated. I believe he knows he is bringing this to the attention of the people of Persia. There are 15 million Jews in Persia. All of a sudden, when you look out and you see maybe it's your neighbor who is in the street crying and praying and wearing sackcloth. All of a sudden, it's not just a, a, a futuristic kind of like, let's just, let's just kill a random group of people. Now it's, oh, it's my neighbor. I know Lord God. I know that God. He's marking themselves that they are separate. They worship a different God, a, a different God. They, they dress different. He's, he's separating himself from the rest of the people. Right? There's no question. They're clearly identified. And in fact, he does this to Esther. We'll get to it in a second. But when, when he's telling uh, the, this, the servant to go and talk to her, remember he says this there at the end of uh, the end of verse 8. He, he tells this, this servant, I thought, uh, go and plead with the king personally for her people. So what did he do for Esther? He outed her as well. He's saying, it's her too. And so he, he's kind of spreading. But this, this is, when I look at this, we specifically, as God's people in this world, are called to be separate. Are called to be separate. We are not, in, in this world, we're not supposed to look like the rest of the world. 
And if we do, then, then we're, we're, we're doing something that, that God commands us not to do. I remember growing up that I wanted so bad, I had moved into this new community in Michigan, and I wanted so bad to be accepted by this group of kids who played basketball. And so I went there, and I played basketball with them for four or five years while we lived in that spot. And I did what they did, I wore what they wore, I played like they played, played, I said the things that they said. And later, I met one of those kids, he became a good friend, and he, I, I, I talked to him about, he said, where did you guys disappear to? And he's like, one day you just left. And I said, well, we went to be missionaries in Bolivia. And he asked me this question, guys, it haunts me to this day. He said, you're Christian? And I think about that, like, as an as a 11, 12-year-old kid, like, that was the height of what I was trying to accomplish. Like, nobody would know who I was. But now I look back and I think, what a gigantic waste of my time. What, what a gigantic feeling of fear that I was so afraid of what they would think. I blended in. I became a Persian in that moment so that nobody would know. But this is God's people. They separate themselves. We wear spiritual sackcloth and ashes, okay? We don't put on sackcloth and ashes. If I asked you guys to do that in church, I'm pretty sure we'd pass over into a cult uh, location. I don't think we're going to do that. But as you, this, is, this is, we wear spiritual sackcloth and ashes. We mourn for the fact that this world is doomed, that we separate ourselves. Now look at what it says. There's something really interesting here in, uh, in chapter 4. Look at verse 2. He says, he went only as far as the king's gate, since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. Why? So he's basically saying if this was the White House, if you were dressed in this, in this clothing of mourning and grief, you couldn't enter the White House. Okay? Why? Let's just, let's just throw it our guesses. There's no wrong answers. I love, I love telling people that. Because there are, but we just will ignore them. Well, why do you think? Why couldn't Mordecai, dressed as he was, go and see the king himself? Dress code. Okay, dress code. Yeah, probably part of it. Yes. What else? Yeah. It's just like appear the best you can in front of the king. Good. I, I, I think we're linking those two things together. I really like that idea. Okay, so this is this is what happened in this in this ancient Near East society. They created an artificial paradise in the palace. So the king was not supposed to see any kind of suffering. So he was not meant to see beggars. He was not meant to see people who were hungry or hurting or starving. He was not meant to see anything that would give him a bad day. Because he was considered in this time of God. Right? So that's the part of what you guys were saying is this idea that you couldn't come before the king looking like something was wrong. Right? And you weren't allowed to do that. That's why when you read the book of Nehemiah, why it is such a, a, an important moment when Nehemiah has been weeping and weeping over the fate of his people, and he goes before the king, and the king looks at him and says, what's wrong? There's something wrong about you, because these kings were not supposed to see that. So uh, I like what, um, what one writer said, let me find it uh, in my notes here. They lived in an artificial paradise where they were protected from suffering and poverty. This is what this writer said. Um, Oh, Oriental kings, here we go. Oriental kings were sheltered from pain and sorrow. They must have good and blessing at any cost. So people could literally be starving around them in their city, but in the palace, everything was good, right? Because we've already read how many feasts we've had. They, they were just sheltered from this kind of stuff. But Mordecai, so what does Mordecai do? Where does he go? Right to the gate. Right to the gate. He's saying, I'm going to come to the very last place that I can come. And, I'm, he, and he's, he's talking about, he's, he's crying out loudly. What he's trying to say is, King Ahasuerus, I'm here. I'm a real person. I'm oppressed. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I'm marked myself out. He's trying to call out the king. And also, he's not allowed to go into the palace. So this is the only way he can connect with, with Esther that, that's hidden there in the palace. Okay, So 15 million Jews. They have nowhere to flee. They have nowhere to go because the empire of Persia spreads from India to Italy. In that, in that day and age, where could you possibly go? And so it says that the people of God, I love this, that what, what Haman did, he sent this decree out to oppress and suppress the people. But what it actually did was cause revival to spread among the people. It says there in verse 3, there was great mourning among the Jewish people. And then it says they fasted, wept, lamented, and many laid sat 
That word fast, what does it mean to fast? Not eat. Why? Why would we do that? To lose weight? No. That, although we've turned it into that, we, we read books like the, the Daniel Diet and the Daniel Fast and, and kind of want to connect the two. But this is what fasting in Scripture is. It's always accompanied by brokenness, humility, sincerity, consecration, and prayer. So this edict, what it caused was God's people to cry out to God. Like, they have been living in Persia for so long, and now it says they're crying back out to the Lord. So they're separating themselves. It gives way to major revival. I love that. And, and we see this throughout history, that every time the people of God are oppressed, that the church grows. Uh, there's a famous line that says that the, the blood of the martyrs, those who have lost their lives for Christ, is the seed of the church, right? That it grows in that soil. So it causes God's people to separate themselves. And this is a picture for us of the church. We are counter-cultural. What, what does that mean? What do you guys think that means? Counter-cultural. Big theological words. Let's just play with them. Yeah, good. Against the common culture, opposite of it. So if the culture says this is right, and Scripture says, no, that's not right. What is the Christian's responsibility? Don't do it. Say, no, that's not right. So right now in our nation, it, it has the blessing of our government. We have the blessing of our government up until almost the point of pregnancy in most states to kill your children before you born, right, to, to commit an abortion, right? That's, 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 and, and lawmakers and politicians and presidential candidates are literally fighting for that platform and that right. So we know that scripture says that God values every human life from conception and into the rest of their life because it's a human soul. So what does it mean for us if the government says yes to abortion? What does it mean for Christians to be countercultural in that, in that circumstance? We say no. We say no, that's not right. We value life and instead we provide support on the other end. So, so women say, well, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for birth. Well, let us help you get ready. Let us help you. Or let us help you find a place where you can adopt this baby. Let us help. So that's what it means to be counter-cultural. And that's what Mordecai and the Jews are doing. We're not going with the flow on this one. We are standing against culture. You refused the clothing, even that Esther sent. She's like, dude, you just, you got to stop doing this. You're going to be killed. You can't go to the king's gate dressed like that. You've got to put on these new clothes. And, and Mordecai does what um, Chloe, our daughter, does every single she takes the clothes I pick out for her. She throws them on the ground. I swear, every morning, I'm in charge. Mindy's asleep because she's been up with the baby. I'm in charge of picking out clothes for Chloe. I don't know what a six-year-old girl wants to wear. Some pink, I don't know, some rainbows. And so I'll, I'll, give, her, I'll give her something. She'll be like, no. And so I'll bring something else. Like, no. And it's like, okay, it's your turn. You pick what you want. And that's always backfires because then she wears like the craziest stuff. If you ever see her, if you're at uh, the elementary campus and you see her, I apologize for her. Um, her clothing and her hair, but that is, that is me. That's all me. But So he, he refuses the clothes. He's like, no, this is who I am. I'm a separate person. So God's people are meant to be separate. The second thing is, let's just run through because I know I'm, I went long in that verse. God's people, number two, cooperate. Cooperate. Now I study this passage over and over and over. And for the life of me, I can't figure out, I couldn't figure out why God gave so much biblical real estate in this chapter to Hathak going back and forth. Did you notice that as we read? Like, it was just a game of telephone. You ever played that game? Where, like, you whisper something to the next person and then to the next person and it changes as you go. But, like, look at the seven verses. You see this in, uh, well, look at this. Let's find it. Verse 4. Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to her. Uh, look in verse 5. Esther summoned Hathak. Uh, verse 6, Hathach went out to Mordecai. Verse 7, Mordecai told him everything that happened. Uh, verse 9, Hathach came and repeated Mordecai's response to Esther. Like that right there, is that a verse we typically like memorize? <laughs> like here's my own one of verses, Hathach came and repeated Mordecai's response to Esther. Like that's not a verse that we make our life verse, but God found it in his sovereignty. He found fit to put this eternally in his word that he says will never change. Look at this. Verse 10, Esther spoke to Thok and commanded him to tell Mordecai. Um, we go down to verse 13. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther. Uh, verse 15, Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. You see, we're just going back and forth. Why would God spend so much time and give so much 
value to this interchange of people going back and forth, I believe it's because this is a picture of what happens when God's people cooperate, when there's communication happening, when we're all on the same page, moving toward the same goals. And so you, you kind of see this interplay uh, between the two. And it's funny because I see those verses and I think that's not a verse that I'm going to ask you all to memorize, but God found it important enough to put in his where the Jewish people, here's the end of this, the Jewish people would not be saved had this little weird interchange of ideas not happened. They, 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 now, we probably would have made the case that they would have been saved in another way, but this is Mordecai and Esther communicating back and forth. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on, but I, I didn't want to move on without talking about Hathach a little bit, right? He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And you're like, how? Oh, he's only in this one chapter. I preached a whole sermon on him a few years ago, and I tried to find uh, the link to it, but I couldn't find it. But I, I want you to see what Warren Wearsby said about this guy. Because we know nothing about him outside this chapter, but this is what Warren Wearsby said. I doubt that Hathak realized what an important part he was playing in God's plan to defeat Haman and save the Jews. He had no idea what he was a part of. So often in the work of the Lord, he uses obscure people to accomplish important tasks. He asked some questions. What was the name of the boy who gave Jesus his loaves and fish? We don't know. Who were the men who rescued Paul by lifting him over that Damascus wall in a basket? We don't know. What was the name of the little servant girl who told Naaman to go see the prophet? We don't know, right? This is what Warren Rears began with. We don't know, but God used these people to accomplish his purposes. And then he said this. I thought this was amazing. As great doors can swing upon small hinges, so great events can turn upon the deeds of small and sometimes anonymous people. I love that. Because there's times in life when I look at some of my friends in ministry, and I know it's not a, a race or a competition, but I have a good friend of mine who really irritates the snot out of me. He's a pastor, and his church has grown by several hundreds in a very tiny town since he took over. And I, I give God the glory for that, but it annoys me. Uh, he has published two books since he's been the pastor. He's completed his doctorate. Um, he is now serving on some, some high-level SBC committees. And I look at that, and I, and I love him to Jesus, and I, and I talk to Jesus about him both positively and negatively. But I look at this and, and, and sometimes I think, you know, sometimes we have the, the kind of reaction is, well, I'm, I'm just one person in the van, Texas. How can I do anything for the Lord? Well, maybe in the grand scheme, in the grand story, in God's sovereignty, God is going to use somebody small and, and insignificant in order to accomplish something incredible. And so that's what, uh, I just wanted to highlight a thought there. He doesn't know what's going on, but he, he's part of this process. So this is what happens when God's people Cooperate though. I gotta tell you, I've seen churches crumble and fall because of a lack of cooperation. Because there's a group of people who want one thing, and there's a group of people who want another thing. And they pull on each other, they, they, they play a tug of war, and nobody wins and everybody loses. This is, this is the thing. I know that we're all not gonna agree on, on all points of theology. I hope that there's some standards that we do agree on, but there are, are, are some, some separate things that we can we can spend all day debating, but at the end of the day, we cooperate toward one common goal. We work together. We're on one team. We're one family. We disagree sometimes, but that's okay. There's, there's disagreement in your family. I disagree with my family today. I love Mindy, and that's where I'll end up. I love her, and, that, and that's it. But we disagree. I mean, we, that's, that's, that's marriage. That's life. That's, that's when two people are passionate about something, and, and so th there was a, a thing yesterday where I was convinced that a person in a movie, that their name was one thing, and she was convinced that it was another. And we're laying in bed, we're like ready to fall asleep. And I pulled out my phone, I was like, I gotta find out if I'm right. And I was not right, and so that, uh, that really bothered me. But, but we cooperate, we communicate, we want. So God's people, this is what marks us here in, in chapter four. We're separate from the world. The second thing is we cooperate together to see things that God's will accomplish. And then number three, this is where if we're really going to hang our hats in the end. God's people trust Him. God's people trust Him. If there's something I can draw us back together with, it's this. You can always trust God. 
He knows the end of your story. He knows the end of your problems. He knows the end of our pain. He's working his perfect will into these things. And, and, and at the end of all things, he looks at us and says, right, I did this thing. We're going we're gonna to find out in heaven. I don't think we'll get answers here on earth, but I think in heaven we're going to look and we're going to say, oh, that's why I struggled with that. Or that's why there was that problem. Because it's earning for me, like Paul says, a far greater and eternal weight in glory. But God's people trust him. Look at verse 10 with me. Esther spoke to Hathak. So, so Mordecai has said, you need to go to the king and tell him to reverse this law. You need to plead for your people. And in verse 10, Esther said, uh, verse 11, all the royal officials and people know that one law applies to everybody, both men and women, who approach the king without being summoned. The death penalty. Now, she is not making an excuse. I think we've given her a bad rap for a long time. Like, she didn't want to do it, and so she's just saying, well, the law says this, so we're going to have to follow the law. She's not. She's just saying that. She's is like, Mordecai, you've got to know what you're asking of me. If you're telling me to go to the king and talk to him, what does that mean for her? Death. Potentially death. That means I, you've got to be willing to walk in there, willing to put all your cards on the table, and willing to lose your life for this. But she trusts him. I love what Mordecai says. If you keep silent, deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. This is Mordecai just trusting in the Lord. Like, I trust even if Esther doesn't do it, if she keeps Silent, God's going to rescue us somehow because God always rescues his people. He's never left them to be destroyed. And so he's telling her this and her response is the same. I love this. Or I love what Mordecai ends with. He says this. Uh, he says here in verse 13, 14, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. And then he says, who knows? Perhaps you've come to your royal position for such a time as this. I laugh out loud in my office when I'm studying this this week. I, I love his, his words, perhaps. Maybe. Maybe this is why you were born. Maybe this is why you were here, Esther. And I look at this and I'm like, Mordecai, I know you're in the middle of it. It's hard to see. But there's no perhaps about this. God placed her there for this reason at that time. And I want to tell you where you are right now. I believe that God sovereignly placed you here. I believe he placed you in the family that you're in. Even if you're like, my sister's annoying the heck out of me. Like, God put you in that place for that reason. Or, or your brothers. We right? can you see that, right? But, or your brothers. <laughs> we know we got a lot of brothers. And brothers and brothers and brothers. But you look at this. God put you in that family. He put you in this town. He put you at this point in history for a reason. Now, God's not going to reveal that reason to you, probably. Because all he wants from you is to walk in obedience with you. Every single day, just say, Lord, I'm going to give you a yes for today. Wherever you call me to go, whatever you call me to do, I'm going to do it. And that's hard. That's, that's, that's Esther looking and saying, okay, if, it's, if that's what it's going to take to be obedient, then I've got to be willing to go before the king to lose my life, if that's what it takes. But God put her there. I, I just love that. Maybe this is why you're here. It's like a light bulb in, in Mordecai's I'm like, oh, maybe this is it. And God's like, yeah, duh. That's exactly why she's here. That's exactly why we're all here in this moment because God is sovereign. So Esther ends her, her little thing, her little speech there saying, you guys go and fast, pray to the Lord, and I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. And she says this famous line in, uh, in verse 16, if I perish, I perish. Let me ask you a question. Don't answer, just think. If you were in a situation like this, where God was quite obviously calling you to do something that it might cost your life, how would you respond? I would love to say, I would love to say, Lord, I would lose my life right now for the sake of the gospel. Okay? I don't know. I can't say that confidently. I mean, I would love to. As your pastor, as your shepherd, I would love to say yes with confidence. But we're human people. And so I would hope, as I, as I look at the story of Esther, I would hope that, that in that moment, if that moment ever came, and, and we don't need to think that it's long in coming. There are people right now, there's people right now who are losing their lives because of Christ. Like, we're comfortable in here. Did it cost you guys anything to come tonight? Maybe your parents like 35 cents in gas. Like, it didn't cost us anything to be here. Right? But the truth is, is that it does cost believers around the world. I just listened to a podcast of a person who was imprisoned in Turkey because he was a pastor and he was preaching, and they, they beat him every single day. He, 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 that's what it costs to be a believer for him. And he was willing to pay the cost. He guess where he, he's right now in the United States. I guess where he's headed back. 
Back to Turkey, back to his home. He's going to go and he's going to preach the gospel again and again. What does that mean for him? It might cost him his life. Right? So that, that's, that's this. Looking at Esther, this is a perfect example of a person who trusts in God. God, my trust is not in my circumstances, but it's in you, and I know that you'll carry me through. So we see her response there. If I perish, I perish. This is where I'll end. Everything was stacked against Esther. Everything. You think about if you've got problems in your life, you think about Esther. Everything in her life was against her. She was the wrong gender. Okay, we're just going to be honest about history. That history has been a very male-centric um, uh, ideology. And so in this culture, women were not valued. In fact, we've seen King Ahasuerus treat women like garbage. We've seen him uh, treat them like cattle, moving, moving through the line. But so, so her gender is against her. This decree, her, her, her nationality is working against her. The government is against her because Haman is in charge. He's the second in command and he wants her dead. So everything in life is against her. And that's a really good place to be, church. A really good place to be. When you know the world is pushing against you, that means what you're doing is right. Romans 8.31 says this, if God is for us, who can be against us? What, what, is it, what does it matter if all the forces of this world push against us, if Christ is with us on our side? No one can stop the Lord Almighty. No one can stay His hand. No one can thwart His purposes. He has no equals. He has no rivals. His will will be. That's the side I want to be on. That's the team that I want to join. So Mordecai and Esther, they steal themselves to the possibility of death. They know if we do this, it might mean our death. And that's the same as God's people. We're separate. We coordinate. We cooperate. We trust him because we know that this life is not the end. When we close our eyes in this world, we're going to open our eyes in eternity. It is not the end. And so they teach us what separates us from them. So... At the end of all things, this is where this world ended. I know I've said that several times, but I want you to see the story of the gospel in these pages. We, just like the people of Israel, we're under a sentence of death. And what brings that in our lives? What gives us that, that death sentence? Why do we deserve death and punishment in hell? Because we're sinners. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says there are none righteous. So it doesn't matter how many good things we do. I said that this morning, guys. Being a part of this church is not going to save you. And in fact, a lot of people, I think, are, are part of churches. And they think that that's going to do something for them. But Jesus said at the end of all things, there's going to be people come and say, Lord, I, I went to church. I did mighty things in your name. I, I was there. I, I did all these things. And Jesus says, but you didn't. So we see this, we're under a sentence of death, and we have one hope. It's not Esther in this situation. She's a type of what's to come. It's that Jesus came and was willing to give his life for you. Isn't that amazing? I, I will never give over that. And I hope you won't either. The fact that Jesus looked at me, and when I was saved, I was 14 years old, and guys, I was, I, Kennedy probably would kick me out of the youth group. Well, maybe not since my dad was the pastor, but uh, he wouldn't have been allowed to, but you should have. <laughs> anyway, I was, I was a punk. I was as rebellious as it's possible to be. I had one thing on my mind that was girls. I, I didn't care about God. I came to church probably every, every Sunday for all of my life, and it, it didn't mean anything to me until I heard the gospel clearly presented, and the Holy Spirit just struck me. I went home and I knelt next to my bed and I said, God, I am tired of playing games. I'm tired of being fake. I'm tired of, of messing around with this. And so I invited him into my heart and I asked him to forgive me of my sins and to be my Lord and Savior. You guys think about this, that God didn't save me because he knew that I would be a pastor one day. That's, that's not why. He didn't, save, he didn't save anybody because of what they will accomplish or what they'll do. He saved me because he is God. He is merciful. He loves his people. He saves them. So when he saved me, it says in Romans <coughs> chapter 5, verse 8, that he died for me while I was still a sinner. I, I, I can't get over that. And we need to see the gospel here in the book of Esther, that Esther stands up like Christ, willing and obedient to go to death in order to save her people. And that's what Christ accomplished for us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I know I give this plea to you every single time that I teach, but you need to hear it over and over. I heard the gospel, I estimated it one time, probably 2,500 times before I came to faith in Christ. 
2,500 times somebody said this to me, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And, and that God intervened when I was hopeless. He sent His Son Jesus to die in my place, to take the penalty for my sins, to be that sacrifice that I needed to be forgiven. And He offers me a, a forgiveness, relationship, and eternal life. I heard that 2,500 times probably before I came to faith in Christ. That's why I give you this message over and over and over. Not just this group, but, but everybody in here. And so if you don't know Christ as your Savior, we're going to end in prayer, but I'm going to invite you just to come talk to me. We're not going to do an invitation, but, but just come, come talk to me. There, there's no better decision you'll ever make in your life than to come to faith in Christ. So if you need to do that tonight, please come talk to me. Father, I, I am so grateful for the story of Esther. I'm so grateful that we see gospel pictures inside this book. I'm so grateful for Esther that she teaches us what faith looks like in the face of death. I pray that I would be willing and obedient to go even to the point of death if it meant that, that, that I would stand for you and stand for your word and stand for your truth. I pray that as, as our nation gets increasingly more and more hostile toward Christianity, I pray that we would not come. We would not dress like the Persians and, and act like them and avoid, try to avoid the penalties of, of standing against culture, but I pray that we would stand strong. And if the, if the country says that, that abortion is, is right and, and, and good, that we would have the courage to say, no, it's wrong. That if they say home, homosexuality and gay marriage is right, that we would have the courage to say, no, it's wrong. We stand on the pages of God's word and we stand on your truth. I pray, Lord, with all my heart that you would help us to be a people who are called out and separate. And we look different, we act different, we talk different, we bear in, in, in who we are, in our manner, in our speech, in our attitude, in our actions. We take Christ with us. That people that are around us know that we are different. Like the apostles, that, that, that the, the, the Sanhedrin looked at them and said, that they marked them as different because they had been with Jesus. And I pray that that's, that's our story as well. Thank you for this awesome group here tonight. I pray that you would bless them for their faithfulness uh, in, in coming out and spending time here in your house to hear your word be preached. Thank you for what you do, Lord. Thank you for Jesus' blood shed on the cross, an uncomfortable topic, but one that without that, Lord, we, have, we would have no hope of being saved. Thank you for what you did for us on the Calvary's cross. I pray that if somebody doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would come to faith in Christ today. We ask this all in the name of Jesus.